What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. I hope you've all had a great week and are looking forward to a packed weekend of football fixtures. As you might have guessed, my Surrey gallery has been through a few more changes as I navigate through the transition of shifting my entire gallery from limited to rare cards. If you haven't checked out my last video, I highly suggest you do as that details some of my thought process behind the move. But in this episode, we're going to take a look at the game weeks past, analyse some of the cards I've moved on since last time we spoke, and discuss why I've now pivoted to an almost exclusively under 23 gallery. If you're enjoying this type of content, leave me a like, consider subscribing to the channel, and if anything we talk about here sparks an idea or question, drop me a comment below and I'll make sure to reply. Before we get started, let's look at where we're currently sitting, and perhaps the first thing you've noticed from the last episode is that the six remaining limited cards I owned have been sold off and we've added a handful more rare cards to the gallery in their place. I'll explain why soon. Our current gallery valuation is around 6.04 ETH, and we have about 0.43 liquid ETH in our wallet, so our total valuation is now sitting at 6.47 ETH, or roughly 19 1640 dollars or 17,290 euros at the time of recording. So despite the comings and goings, we've still risen in value in fiat currency terms. As I said, we'll go through those transfers in and out shortly, but before we do, I wanted to take a quick moment to discuss something we haven't really talked about in this series yet, and that's the current state of the game and the reward structure as a whole. I'm certainly not the most qualified to be speaking on this topic, which is why I generally prefer to leave it to those who have been around longer than I have, and have also analysed the situation in more detail, but it's clear to see from anyone who's looked at the so rare data charts or played SO5 over the last few weeks, that the platform is growing at an increasingly fast pace. More and more users are joining the game, picking up cards and competing for rewards. By all metrics, the user base is at all time high numbers, which for so rare as a company is exciting, but it is also a crucial period for them to navigate in terms of their communication and transparency. There have been several posts and threads on Twitter and Discord regarding the amount of rewards being paid out over current game weeks. And by the looks of things, the team have made a decision to lower the amount of cards given out relative to the amount of eligible cards now in each division, as well as the amount of lineups competing. And this means that the probability of winning rewards has been lowered, but it's also been met with a lack of explanation from the so rare side, even despite the boom in manager numbers. I'm sure many of you have noticed how competitive every division is becoming at the moment with the swell in new users, and it's a major reason why I've decided to leave limiteds behind. But the fact that it's coincided with a proportionate nerf of rewards without clear and open communication as to why is frustrating for new and old players alike. I don't want to spend too much time on the topic during this video, but I would say that from a business perspective, this is perhaps a landmark moment for so rare in defining who they are as a company. Actions speak louder than words, and this is perhaps the most important time to be honest and transparent with the community and user base as a whole. Open communication during this period is more important than ever because with so many new eyes on the platform, it's critical that these users are reassured and feel a trust with the direction of the game, especially considering we sit in the blockchain and NFT space where so much distrust and short-term thinking is harbored. So rare need to give confidence to their users that they actually care about them as well as the overall health and ecosystem of the game, rather than simply the spike in revenue or the profit they're generating or whatever their focus may be. I'm sure they're doing their best and maybe there's something wider going on here. Maybe they're working on implementing new and improved game modes, but I personally think it's important for them to explain some of their decision making process surrounding the game at large to avoid disengagement and distrust in the project. That's my thoughts on it, let me know if this is something you've been thinking about too, but yeah, hopefully we see changes that reflect fairness and common sense in the future, as well as transparency from those decision makers at the top that builds back some trust with us as a user base. Okay, before I walk you through the changes that have been made to my gallery and why I made them, let's take a look back at the last game week before these moves and see how it went. So game week 242 and the limited side was let down by Morioka going off injured at half time, as well as Akun, but we did manage to hit the upper threshold with our rare side despite using a common keeper, and Munayin only coming on as a sub in the second half against Espanyol, so it was nice to have that point zero two come in to keep us ticking over regardless. The first game week with the sides I assembled in the last Last episode did however spark some serious thoughts around gallery depth and utility. It didn't take me too long to make a decision and realise that I could and should adopt a strategy that ultimately made me secure and successful when I first started playing in the limited divisions, and that was to have a foundational core of good U23 cards to prioritise that division, rotate where needed to account for matchups, form, injuries and suspensions. Some so rare future stars if you will. By having a gallery with diverse utility, you can pick and choose where to put your players each game week, rather than being forced to only play them in one. And with that in mind, I also wanted to pick up a base of cards that will be able to compete during the European off-season. I wanted to avoid top U23 players from Champion Europe, as those cards come at premium, and for the price of one of those, I could pick up two or three comparative scorers in lesser divisions. So who's gone and who's stayed? Well firstly, as I stated before, my entire limited side was sold off for a loss. 
I really wanted to build this core of rare U23s so I could play my first choice squad in that division and then the second string squad in All Star to perhaps gain threshold ETH and maybe the odd reward if I'm lucky. It also leaves the pathway open to U23 Pro as I'm only one or two super rares away from being able to field sides in that division too. So it's nice to have a path to the higher division should I wish to pursue that. In terms of my rare cards, anyone who wasn't U23 eligible was sold for either a small profit or a small loss and I also broke exactly even on my Sven Botman card. As I said, I saw it as a bit of a waste holding a champion Europe U23 defender worth 0.85 when I could pick up three other defenders for that money and stretch out my utility profile. My Sapporo stack was dismantled but I have kept the U23 contingent of that. Kaneko and Ogashiwa have stayed as well as Venetia Souza who I believed would play a part in my future plans. My ideas in the last episode were well thought out, I just don't think I'd accounted for just how shallow the depth of my squads were. So now in the instance where a player might be out, another will just slot in and take his place and I'm not worrying so much or having to sell them on at a loss. Alright so I've sold my limiteds and I've sold all my rares that aren't U23 eligible. How have I gone about identifying and picking up rare under 23s that aren't selling at premium prices and have the potential to fill in over the summer and also perhaps are able to replicate some of the top tier cards in the division on the occasional basis. For those of you who've watched previous episodes you'll know that I use a range of data points to look at particular cards. So rare data being the main starting point, sofa score and transfer marked supplementing that information and FB ref is the site I featured previously when analyzing underlying statistics such as expected goals, expected assists and shot creating actions amongst many others. Unfortunately the data on FB ref only applies to players in Europe's top five leagues so basically only champion Europe players and seeing as I was going to be shopping in a wider market I thought it would be prudent to find underlying data and analysis for those players playing outside those leagues that I was going to be looking at. Now there are a number of services that provide the information but the one I went to is a scouting and video analysis platform called called Scout. This is a paid service so it isn't free and I'm not 100% sure whether their terms and conditions allow me to retransmit their platform for content creation purposes so I'm going to play it safe and leave off any screen capture in this video but if you're interested in Scout, you can check it out for yourself I'm not affiliated with them in any way it's not cheap either but I believe they offer a trial period for new users and this is basically a global platform used by real football scouts and analysts to scout players all over the world. As someone who views themselves as a total amateur when it comes to scouting and analysis I wanted to see perhaps how the underlying stats have come to know from SofaScore and FBRF translate to the SO5 scoring matrix and how those stats from Scout perhaps translate to the scores of lesser known players. And also whether or not I could see some correlation between the scouting stats and the end results on so rare. Alright so now you know a little bit about the thought process. I'm taking in as many different sources of information as I can to try and boil a list of potential options down. Taking account of price, form, underlying stats and real SO5 scores. I'm hesitant to call this a money ball approach because the players I've picked up aren't exactly unknowns or dirt cheap in the so rare world but I'm hoping they can come together in certain game weeks to produce relatively competitive scores given that they are perhaps cards on a mid-level budget for under 23s. So first of all when I was scouting I generally looked at players 22 years old and younger. I'm not interested in cards losing their utility in a few months time and I wanted players that would keep their value in the longer term due to them staying eligible in the division for the foreseeable future. So let's start off and get the goalkeepers out of the way first and if you take a look at my gallery you'll see I've picked up Kosei Tani for 0.8 and Thomas Hassel for 0.75. These two should, and I underline should here, be fairly nailed on U23 keepers and also both play over the European offseason which is a major bonus and a reason for picking them up. I also wanted to have two because I wouldn't be relying on one staying fit or being suspended or not because I'll hopefully be able to play one of them in U23 and the other in All-Star as a backup. There hasn't been too much analysis put into these pickups other than them being starting goalkeepers for their sides in divisions that keep playing over the summer break. I've learned that goalkeepers are relatively the same on this game. Depending on the defense in front of them and how many clean sheets they're likely to keep, those are the only real differences between them score-wise. After taking a quick glance at the stats though, I think Tani will be the first choice in U23 and I'll be running Hassel in All-Star until such time that he proves himself to be a more consistent performer or as I said, if Tani becomes unavailable. They're a sizable investment but as anyone will tell you, goalkeepers and especially U23 keepers come at a premium on this game. But then they also unlock the ability for you to field lineups, so they're a necessary expense. Okay moving to the other end of the pitch and let's analyze the selection of forwards I now have at my disposal. As I mentioned earlier I've kept Ogashiwa. He is about to come back into action this weekend which is fantastic. So when it came to picking up a couple of other young forward options I really analyzed a lot of the underlying stats provided by Y Scout, correlated that with the scores on Sora data and made somewhat informed decisions that way. The first thing I noticed from statistics of players 22 and under such as goals and assists per 90, expected goals and assists and successful attacks 
attacking actions, etc., is that the more expensive players of that age on so rare were towards the top of those charts. Naturally, your Mbappes and Hallands were up there, but so were the likes of Noah Lang, Karim Adeyemi, Julian Alvarez, Luis Sinistera, and Darwin Nunes, just to name a few. Now, they are almost all one ETH plus cards, and out of my price bracket, so I needed to perhaps identify a couple of options that weren't quite as powerful in scoring outputs, but at least capable of stringing together some goals on a semi-regular basis. The first player I settled on was Tazos Duvikas for 0.3 ETH. 22 years old, playing for Utrecht and in the Greek national side. Duvikas was flying at the start of this season, banging in the goals. He now has 7 goals and 3 assists from 22 games, 19 of which were starts, so 10 decisives and 19 start, which is very solid, and it was the underlying stats that swayed it for me. He's actually underperformed his expected 0.47 goals per 90, only producing 0.4, and his expected assists are 0.12 per 90, which is relatively high for a centre forward. Again, he's underperforming there as well with just 0.09 assists per 90. If he can recapture some of the form he had earlier in the season, as he started to do in recent weeks, Duvigas has some great underlying stats that could very well translate to solid SO5 numbers towards the tail end of the season too. Now, when I was looking to the off season, I tried to have two options in each position to once again account for those form and injury concerns. So I had Ogashiwa from Sapporo as one option and was looking to the MLS for the other. Jesus Ferreira was the obvious option given his high AA scores and general high overall scores, but his price has been inflated over the last few weeks and I wanted to look for a slightly cheaper option who could perhaps break out this year. I settled on Brenner from Cincinnati. He heavily underperformed his expected returns last season and with a new coach and backroom staff in place at Cincinnati and a year of MLS under his belt, this could be a breakout year for him. In fact, his expected 12.29 goals and assists last season ranked him higher than Jesus Ferreira and the likes of Barco and Ricardo Pepe. He had an expected 0.3 xG per 90 and only produced 0.18. So if he manages to kick on a little this season under a new regime, I'll be happy to have him as a forward option during the off season too. I picked him up for 0.375, so not the cheapest, and he is a gamble with less AA game and being decisive dependent. But fingers crossed he comes good this year. The last player I picked up was more of an investment and that's Mohamed Darami. He's currently sitting on the bench for Ajax, but when I was analysing some of the underlying attacking stats, he was competing and in some cases beating many of Europe's young elite forwards in stats such as successful attacking actions, expected assists, progressive passes and goals per 90. I don't expect to be fielding him in many lineups for a while, but the fact he ranked so highly amongst other far more expensive forwards means that if and when he starts getting game time or perhaps a loan move in the future, I suspect he'll post up some big scores and boom in price. So if you look at those four forward options, I've assembled them for a combined 1.26 ETH. Ideally, I'll look to pick up an elite U23 forward in the future, but I'm happy to use these cards as my options for now, especially due to the fact they have potential, room to grow, and the ability to start hitting higher scores in the weeks ahead. Looking at my defensive options now, and once again, I've adopted the off-season utility mentality by picking up two of the best options from Asia and the MLS, and they are Akuma Sekigawa and Julian Araujo for 0.38 and 0.215 respectively. Sekigawa is a high scoring centre back for a young Atlas side who has high AA scores thanks to his tackling and interception numbers comparative to the rest of the league. As far as I know he's a nailed spot on the side and besides Tsunamoto at fullback, I'm hoping Atlas can have a solid start to the season. Araujo is perhaps the best defensive option for his age in the MLS. He's actually ranked highest for interceptions of any defender 23 and under last season and second for defensive duels. He's a fullback who tends to get forward and that's also reflected in his successful attacking actions per 90, which rank him higher than decisive capable defenders like Sugawara and Gavardiol. When the MLS kicks back off, I may well be looking at running Araujo as my first choice defender in U23. The other two defenders I brought in were David Affengruber and Cenk Oskaka, both are solid SO5 scorers with L15s of 52 and 54, but they also have the ability to hit big scores on their day. Now that could be down to their successful defensive actions per 90 stats, which ranks them some of the highest amongst their peers. That also means that they're often busy in games, which would suggest their sides don't often dominate, but they themselves still put up high interception and tackle numbers, which translates well to a solid all-around average score. They were signed for 0.273 and 0.188, so not overly expensive, both young, performing well, and with room to improve further. In fact, if you look at both of their cards on Surat, you'll notice that PK owns five Appengruber rares and three Oscar cars. He must have some knowledge of what makes a good defender, right? That being said, he did captain himself in his all-star super rare team last weekend then proceeded to get sent off talk about sabotaging your own lineups anyway those are my four defensive options all up costing me just over an eth and i'm relatively happy with what i have there 
And lastly, in the midfield, I've hung on to Vinicius Souza and Kaneko, and despite Souza's high price, I strongly believe in his all-round defensive game, contributing to consistently green SO5 scores. And on that note, I picked up a similar profile of defensive midfielder in 19-year-old Eric Martel from Austria Wien. He's another player who racks up tons of tackles and interceptions in front of his back four. He isn't likely to hit decisives, but his all-round game is a dream for the scoring matrix with his successful defensive actions per 90 and interceptions per 90 only second to Souza and ahead of champion Europe players like Chuamani and Kone. I don't expect him to rival them in overall score, but I can expect consistency from a player who's U23 eligible until 2026. And with summer in mind, I looked to the American region and picked up another good performer in Agustin Almendra from Boca Juniors for 0.35. His all-around score over the last 40 games ranks him fourth for U23 midfielders in the Americas, ahead of more expensive options like Enzo Fernandez and Thiago Almada. Almendra is a slightly more decisive, capable box-to-box -box midfielder, able to play key passes to split a defense, shoot from long distance, and get stuck into a tackle. Given he's fit and playing in the off-season, he'll be the midfielder I look to for high AA game, whereas Kaneko is more an attacking midfielder who is less AA and more decisive dependent during that time. And keeping it on box-to-box -box style players, this last player is perhaps the one I'm most excited about scouting. When I was analysing and comparing the data on Scout, I wanted to find a player in the midfield who put up high defensive work alongside attacking output that would suggest the perfect balance of all-round game that fits the SO5 scoring matrix to a T. So I began filtering through players who were 22 or under with a decent amount of minutes played with both high successful defensive actions, high successful attacking actions, high interception numbers and high expected assists per 90. And there was one name that kept cropping up time and time again and that was Alexander Prass from Sturm Graz. By all metrics other than expected goals, he seemed to be the exact profile of box-to-box -box midfielder I was looking for. He's only really settled into the starting lineup for his side over the last couple of months and his SO5 numbers have been consistent since then. But you can see from his all-around game that the numbers I'm looking at on his scouting reports are fairly well translated to so rare. The only real weakness compared to other midfielders of his caliber is his passing accuracy. So he may lose points for possession lost at times. But I was so confident in this guy being underpriced at 0.19 that I decided to pick up two of him. We'll see how it pans out over the tail end of the season, but this guy is the hidden gem I'll be riding or dying with to really judge my scouting ability. Prass is one to watch, let's keep an eye on him together over the next few weeks and see how it goes. I'm so excited for this particular card though. In fact, if we look at my lineups for this game week 246, Prass is going to be the captain for my first ever entry into the red U23 division. Tanny's in goal, Affengruber is stacked with Prass, and I've gone for the semi Sapporo stack of Kaneko and Ogashiwa up top. In All-Star I've got Courtois in goal until Hassel's back, and then Sakagawa in defence, Martel and Souza in midfield, and Duvikas up front. I'm feeling like I'm in a much more comfortable spot with my gallery now. Being able to chop and change across divisions and also having young, talented and valuable cards is going to serve me well in the future. I also have a chunk of just under half an ETH to deploy if and when I need to, or if I see any potentially underpriced cards. What do you think of the choices I've made? Personally, under 23s are my favourite cards to play with. It comes from that football manager wonder kid sentiment of identifying future world beaters that I know many of us find so addicting. I hope you all have good game weeks this weekend. If you enjoyed the Video, leave me a thumbs up. I'll also leave a link to a longer form chat I had with Quinny this week in the description below. We chatted for over an hour about the moves I've been making and also all things so rare, so feel free to check that out if you wish. But that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.